Hi, I'm Christina, and this video is going to be my experience with symptoms and diagnosis for myasthenia gravis. I'm making this video because when I was first diagnosed, I felt like I was the only one in the world and I wanted to see what other people's experiences were. So I hope that the videos that I'm making are going to be helpful to those of you who have MG or maybe know someone who's experiencing MG. This particular video, I'm going to talk about the symptoms that I have and how I got my diagnosis. I also have other videos that I'm making about my experience with IVIG infusions, what about my thymectomy surgery, and one about the medication that I'm taking. So I'll just talk really briefly about what MG is for context before I talk about my specific symptoms, because with MG, everyone's symptoms are a little bit different. It's referred to as the snowflake disease, lovingly, <laughs> because snowflakes are all different and unique and individual, and all of our symptoms as uh, people with MG are going to be a little bit different as well. So the disease itself is a disease of the neuromuscular junction, so where the nerves and the muscles communicate. Usually your body sends nerve impulses through to your muscles, telling your muscles to contract. So the nerve goes through the junction, the muscles receive the, the message and contract. If you have MG, your body's creating antibodies that kind of block that message from getting through, maybe a little bit sneaks through. So it's harder to contract your muscles, which means they fatigue more easily. So one of the defining things about myasthenia gravis is not just the kind of overall general fatigue that we get from chronic illness, because I know a lot of us get that, myself included, but specific muscle fatigue that gets worse with use and better with rest. Because the more you use it, you're using up that little bit of the neural impulses that are going through. And once there's no juice in the tank and your muscles don't have those nerve impulses, they're not going to contract. But once you rest and a little more creeps through, you can use them again. So the fatigue happens in specific muscles that you're using repeatedly. There are also generally two kinds of MG. One is ocular, where it only affects the ocular muscles, so the muscles around your eyes, and then there's generalized MG. Mine is generalized. Uh, generalized MG affects your skeletal muscles, which is practically all of them. <laughs> and although everybody's symptoms are different, uh, mine really does affect all of my muscles to varying degrees, which we'll talk about. So the first thing I want to talk about as far as symptoms is what it feels like for me in my muscles with MG, but then I want to kind of go back in time and talk about the symptoms that I had and how I got to the point where we even figured out what it was, because it took two years of me having symptoms to get a diagnosis and everything finally started to click together. So for me, what I physically feel in my body from MG is weight and heaviness in my muscles primarily along with the weakness and the fatigue that comes from using your muscles. And again, it's the muscles that you're using. So if I'm walking a lot or standing a particular day, it's my leg muscles that will get fatigued and the heaviest. Uh, today, I've been sitting a lot, but I've been using my hands. I've been making tea. I've been doing my makeup and I'm talking with my hands and my arms are really heavy and weak right now. So the weakness, it literally just feels like it takes so much extra effort to do a regular thing. So for example, if I were to lift up my phone, have my phone case here, if I were to lift up my phone and hold it and just scroll through Instagram or whatever, the weight of the phone in my hand feels like I'm holding a dumbbell in my hand. And now imagine the effort that it takes you usually to pick up your phone versus the effort for like a bicep curl with a dumbbell. It takes all that extra effort that you would normally reserve for working out really hard just to pick up my phone on a normal day. The only feeling that I can relate it to, and I'll kind of break it down in a little more detail, but the only feeling I can relate it to is if you're someone who works out or has worked out in the past, when you get to that, like the very last rep, like the very last squat that you're doing after you've been working out for 45 minutes and your body physically can do it, you can do the squat, but it's the last thing that you could physically possibly do. And you're coming up from the squat and you're like, oh, I did it. That's how my body feels all the time. That much effort the very last squat type of effort is what it takes to do everything. So the physical feeling that I get, like for example, I mentioned that my arms are kind of weak and heavy right now. So the weight, the heaviness that I'm feeling is literally like there are weights tied to my arms that are pulling everything down. And again, that's what I'll feel for whatever muscle group is affected at that time. So it feels like everything is just weighty and heavy and being pulled down, which makes it even harder to put that effort in. For me, I know not everybody experiences this, but I also get like a tingling sensation in my muscles. It's kind of the same type of sensation as when you like 
if you sit on your foot or your hand or something and it goes it goes numb and you get that like pins and needles except that's really intense that's like a stabby kind of pins and needles dial the intensity of that down but constant so think of weight heavy muscles it takes that last squat effort to move and you've got that tingly sensation at all times that's what my muscles feel like in a flare now all that being said there are some muscles that are affected differently for example my eyelids uh, were one of the first muscles that were affected by my mg that feels like droopy heavy eyes now some people with mg get eyelids that just droop or maybe one eye that droops and they can't physically open it higher i've always been able to keep my eyes open but it's been really difficult uh, so it feels like my eyelids are just heavy and like they're physically falling and I have to fight to keep them up. That fortunately doesn't happen to me anymore, but it was one of the very first symptoms that I got. Another one of the first symptoms that I got was swallowing issues. So if the muscles responsible for swallowing your food and pushing it down your throat into your stomach get fatigued, then that process doesn't happen all the way and food will get stuck in your throat. So that's something that's really common for a lot of people who have MG. Again, one of the first symptoms that I had was swallowing issues. So what that feels like for me, I don't feel any of that heavy, weighty, tingling sensation in my throat muscles, but uh, it looks like food getting stuck in my throat and not going down, pills getting stuck in my throat. I've had pills stuck in my throat for days. I've had to go to the ER for a pill stuck in my throat. Um, coughing and choking when drinking something, coughing and choking on saliva. Uh, because anything that gets try that tries to get pushed down your throat just won't go all the way. So the two very first symptoms that I had of my MG were my eyelids feeling really heavy and not being able to keep them open and getting pills and food stuck in my throat. Now at that time, I thought they were two totally unrelated things. I just thought that I was tired. Like who thinks that their eyelid muscles are fatigued? That's not a thought that you would have. <laughs> I just thought I was really, really tired for some reason, even though I was sleeping more. Um, and I went to my uh, allergist and an ENT who told me I had acid reflux. I had to get a swallow study done, and that's why I was having issues swallowing. Then the next month, so that was July 2019 when I first got those two symptoms. In August of 2019, I started getting the heavy, weighty feeling in just my thighs at that point that eventually spread to my lower legs, that eventually spread to my forearms, my wrist, and my upper arms. And that process took a maybe two months for that spread, to, no, three to four months for that whole spread to happen. Um, as that was happening, I was getting the weighty feeling, the heavy feeling. Um, one thing that you'll find in MG and talking to doctors is because pain is not a symptom of myasthenia gravis. If you say something hurts, even doctors who are familiar with MG might not, they might rule it out. Um, However, even though pain isn't a symptom, it's not like you have sharp shooting pain. I've had nerve damage. I know what that feels like. That sucks. It's not anything like that. But I mean, go back to the dumbbell thing. If you hold a dumbbell in your hand for 24 hours, it's going to hurt. Eventually, you're going to say my arm hurts. So I was going to the doctors and saying my legs hurt. My arms hurt. It's spreading. I don't know what's going on. I had a back x-ray done. I had a hip x-ray done. All of that was fine. I had to go to physical therapy for my back. Uh, my ankles were swelling um, on mostly on days that I walked a lot, but it kind of got to the point that I would even wake up in the morning and my ankles were swollen and really, really swollen. Like, so at that point, they were concerned that it was circulatory. So I had an EKG done. That was fine. I had an echocardiogram done. That was fine. So there was no reason for the crazy ankle swelling. Um, and then they found out I had a vitamin D deficiency. Now, vitamin D deficiency and MG are not linked to my knowledge, but in general, my understanding is that if you have an autoimmune disease, you're more likely to have low vitamin D levels. So everybody said, that's what it is. It's the vitamin D. Here's a massive dose of vitamin D. So I had to do um, 50,000 units of vitamin D once a week for 12 weeks, and then go back and make sure my vitamin D levels were fine and reassess. When I went back, the doctor who I had been seeing, who I never saw again after this, uh, not only forgot to do the vitamin D test to check to see what my levels were, spoiler alert, they had not changed for whatever reason, my body was still not absorbing the vitamin D, but she determined that I had tennis elbow and that was why I had all these symptoms. 
and I was like, oh. <laughs> um, and she kept asking, like, do you have, do you do any repetitive motions with, I mean, bilateral. So like both elbows, I had tennis elbow and I'm like, no, no repetitive motion. She's like, do you lift weights? I'm like, no. Um, she also determined that I had IT band syndrome again, bilateral equally on both sides. There was nothing I was doing in my life that should have caused, um, IT band syndrome or tennis elbow. There weren't those repetitive muscle actions. So it wasn't explaining anything. So in my opinion, the question then should have been, why is she having these muscle reactions that are causing tennis elbow and IT band syndrome if the muscles aren't physically doing the things that should be causing it? Uh, but no, so she just decided that was the answer. It didn't explain um, any other area of my body that I was feeling it. It didn't explain the ankle swelling. It didn't explain anything at all. And she just kind of set me out the door with the prescription to go to physical therapy. And um, that was it, forgot to do my vitamin D test. And I was just kind of like, fuck it. And I left and I was so upset. <laughs> um, I did end up going to a rheumatologist after that. Um, and he ruled out fibromyalgia because I was kind of feeling like that's what it might have been at that point based on my Googling. And he ruled that out. He said my touch points were not right. The way that I was experiencing the sensation, the feeling in my muscles was not right. He also did a vitamin D test and determined that my vitamin D was just as low as before. I did that massive 12 week dose which the other doctor would have found if she had remembered, but she didn't. She just told me I had tennis elbow and left. Um, so I had to do another massive dose of vitamin D. And at that point we're going, okay, well obviously it's still a vitamin D deficiency because uh, my body didn't absorb the first dose, did a second dose and assumed all my symptoms were gonna go away. Since then, I've also been taking um, 20,000 units per week on a regular basis just to keep my levels uh, normal. And my levels are normal now. They're still low normal, but they're normal. So I kind of thought that did it and that was it because after that my symptoms got a lot better and I wasn't really experiencing the same kind of things anymore. However, it coincided with when lockdown happened. So I was at home inside. I wasn't walking. I wasn't driving. I wasn't doing anything. That being said, I was still active. I was doing four Zoom Pilates classes a week, um, but it was the only physical activity I was doing. Everything else was just like walk from the bed to the office, to the kitchen, and that was it. So I guess I had the, the juice in the tank to do the Pilates and nothing else. So during lockdown, I was fine. Even when I went back to work, um, I teach postgraduate estheticians. So usually we have two, three hour classes per day where I'm standing. I was sitting and teaching to a, to a camera for a whole year and I felt pretty okay for a whole year. It would kind of come and go. I would feel my IT bands when I was doing Pilates or whatever it was, but the ankle swelling stopped and I was mostly okay. It was just mildly annoying sometimes. Then we started having students come back in again and I was standing more often again and my legs started getting really bad, really uncomfortable. That's when I noticed that my arms and hands were more affected too. And eventually it got to a point where I was so uncomfortable that I was like, I have to go back to the doctor because all of this stuff is coming back. So I went to the same doctor's office as the shitty doctor I had seen before because they had all my records. They would have had the last two years of knowing what was going on. But I saw a different doctor who I hadn't seen before. This doctor though, she listened to everything I said, every symptom. She asked questions to clarify. And then after my whole spiel, um, including how annoyed I was at the last doctor, she paused and first of all said, I'm so sorry that you're experiencing that. That sounds really difficult. I want to repeat what you said back to me and make sure that I understand. And even right off the bat, I was like, you out here listening to me? <laughs> Hearing my concerns, which is not something we always experience with doctors. And she paraphrased everything that I had said. And I was like, yeah, okay, she gets it. And then she started asking questions. Um, and she was saying things like, is it worse at the end of the day than it is at the beginning of the day. And I was like, yeah. And she said, do you feel like you only get tired in certain areas of your body? And I was like, yeah. And she said, do you ever have trouble standing up after you've been sitting down? And I was like, yeah. And normally when you go to the doctor a lot and you're trying to get something diagnosed that ends up being rare, um, these questions, no matter what question they ask, it's always like, no, no, no. And you're ruling out every friggin' disease and disorder because they don't know that yours is the one in this percentage. 
So the fact that she was asking questions and all the answers in a row were yes, I was like, she's on to something. <laughs> and the moment that I knew that she knew what it was, I didn't know what it was yet, but she kind of paused for a second and then she went, do your eyelids ever feel heavy? And I was like, yeah, all the time. I just thought I was tired. Like I had no idea it was even something that I needed to, to mention. I just thought that meant I was tired. But she put it together and she said, I think you have my CD Gravis. At the time, I did not register the name of what she said. She explained bl briefly what it was and said she was gonna do a blood test for it. And I was like, cool. And that was the first time that I felt like, okay, we're onto something. Um, and it, it, it felt good. That being said, I didn't remember the words that she said. So I just remembered she said there was a muscle disease that started with M. So I just Googled muscle disease M and let Google autocomplete for me. Um, do not recommend. <laughs> I ended up on myositis and I was like, how many muscle diseases can there be? A, a few. Um, and myositis is not what I have. And as I was reading the symptoms, I was like, well, this kind of sounds like what I have, but not entirely. And I don't really get it. It didn't feel right. Then I, I remember that I can look into the like portal that the doctor's office have so I could see her notes from after the visit. And when I saw the words myasthenia gravis written out, then I was like, okay, let me Google that. And when I Googled it, it was basically just listing every symptom I've had over the past two years, even down to like the swallowing, which I had not even mentioned to her. Cause again, I just thought it was acid reflux. Um, but every single thing, the swallowing issues, the eyelid issues, the weight of the muscles, the way that it started, it started with my eyes and then generalized. And it, it's just, I knew immediately when I Googled that I was like, this is the thing. This has, this has to be what it is. Nothing else has even come close to explaining every single thing that I've experienced. So she had sent away for the blood test for MG, which was the, uh, ACHR. Um, and she, that was the only one that she put in cause that was the one that she was familiar with at the time. And as I was waiting for that to come back, everything got worse. Uh, I had a day at work. I only taught a three hour class. So I stood for three, maybe four hours and I was just done. I couldn't stand the rest of the day. I, I was just a mess at work. Driving home was really difficult for me because the effort that it took to push my foot against the pedals to drive home, it was just so incredibly just painful and uncomfortable and it was so hard and I was crying on my drive home the entire hour it took me to drive home. I was just crying, but I knew I couldn't stop because if I stopped and pulled over, I didn't feel like I would be able to to start again. So it's like I have to push through to get home. I had to literally pull myself out of my car to get into the house. When I got into the house, I just collapsed on the couch and was crying. Um, and my husband was like, what is going on? And I was like, my legs hurt so bad. I can't, I, I can't walk. I can't drive. And I'm just crying. And then when I tried to get up to go to the bathroom, I couldn't stand up off the couch. Like I just, I'm looking at my legs and they're not moving. And in my brain, I'm trying to make them move and they're not moving. And it was very, it was, it was scary. Like that, I, it was, it was scary. Um, so I had to use my arms to push myself up the way I'd use my arms to pull myself out of the car. And I, I was able to walk up the steps and like pull myself up the steps uh, uh, on the railing and go to the bathroom. But then I couldn't stand up from the toilet. Um, and I, <laughs> crying again. Um, and thank God the way that our bathroom is at our house, the toilet's in this kind of little cubby between two walls. And I had to literally use my arms to like push against the wall and army crawl my way up so that I could stand up off of the toilet. And that was the moment that I was like, I'm not, I'm not okay. Something is really wrong and it's getting worse. Um, and at that point, the MG was kind of in the back of my mind because that's what she had mentioned and that's what I had Googled, but the blood test was still out. And at that time I did not know that you can be seronegative, which I'll talk about. So I went back to the doctor. I had an emergency appointment, not with my doctor, but with one of her colleagues and, um, he put me on medication for fibromyalgia in the meantime while they were waiting for the MG test. And a rheumatologist had already told me that I did not have fibromyalgia, but fibromyalgia is one of those things that if you have unexplained pain and they can't figure it out, they just tell you you have fibromyalgia. Some people obviously really do have fibromyalgia and medication can help with that, but a lot of people are misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia, which is what happened to me. So he put me on these fibro meds. They didn't work because I don't have fibro. <laughs> um, and then, I went back again to see my doctor 
as a my regular doctor as a follow-up and I told her these things that were happening and it was beginning to happen more regularly that I wasn't able to stand up without using my arms um, and they they took me off the fibro meds they at first started me on the fibro meds raised my dosage it was amitriptyline which I've been on before for for other chronic illness things uh, and it worked then but it's not working now because MG does not respond to amitriptyline so I started on 10 milligrams and they said, well, that's too low to affect fibro. So let's go up to 25. So I went to 25. It still did nothing. So they eventually took me off of the amitriptyline and the doctor said, I think you need to see a neurologist. There's not much else we can do at this point. At that point, I had already made a neurology appointment. <laughs> After I had um, read about MG online and I was convinced that like this is the thing that I have, I made an appointment with a neurologist in Philly where I live that was listed on like the Myasthenia Gravis website as an MG specialist and I was I had to wait two months for an appointment with him and I was really grateful that I had to wait two months because it was technically 10 months for his wait time but I talked to his assistant not just like the general receptionist but specifically the neurologist assistant and when I told him my doctor suspects that I have myasthenia gravis, he said, okay, we can get you in sooner for that. And he gave me the first available appointment, which was two months. So when I got to the neurologist, he did two tests in the, in the room that were a little bit different than other things that I had had specifically looking for MG. One of them was he just had me look up for 60 seconds and it, it was way harder than I thought it was going to be. Uh, apparently one of the things with MG is because your muscles fatigue so quickly, looking up for 60 seconds will make your eyelids droop and mine did in the office, although very, very subtly and subtle is actually a word that he used to describe my symptoms. I have a mild case of MG with all this, believe it or not, this is still considered mild. Um, and then I had been getting neck weakness and jaw weakness as well. And because my neck had been bothering me, he was trying to figure out if he could fatigue my neck the way he fatigued my eyes. So he did this thing where he took his hand on my forehead and he, pushed back on my forehead and my job was to push up into his hands and they were pushing against each other and then the goal is for my neck muscle to do the work and see if it fatigues after doing that 10 times in a row and it really did <laughs> after the 10th time he let his hand go after pushing my head back and my head just dropped um and it was so I, I cried immediately immediately as soon as my head dropped I just bawled <laughs> um because I, I couldn't I couldn't pick my neck up and he was like, does that happen at, at the end of the day when you go home? And I'm like, yeah, I even have a little pillow specifically that I keep on my couch so that I can keep my neck propped up rather than just letting my head drop and fall. And uh, that combined with all of my other symptoms and all of my history and everything, he said he thinks I have seronegative myasthenia gravis. So seronegative being not showing up in the blood work. So my blood tests were negative. I didn't know that was a thing that could happen. What is my kitty doing? What are we doing? Hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so my blood work was negative, um, but I had all of the symptoms. Uh, every single symptom, like I said, was just textbook myasthenia gravis, just subtle, like he said. So my, I do have a milder form of it. Um, Sorry, I have lots of kitties. You want to be in the video? What are you doing? So those are those are two of my three kitties who are uh, who are video bombing us at the moment. <laughs> anyway, back to the real stuff. So he started me on Mestinon immediately, which is in another video I'll talk about with my medication. Um, and I had to get an EMG done and a single fiber EMG. And EMG is where they contract your like big muscle contractions to see if your muscles fatigue after those big contractions. Um, so if you've ever been hooked up to a TENS unit where your muscles like jump while you're connected to it, it feels like that, but way more intense. <laughs> it was really uncomfortable. Um, and also I had to get the single fiber EMG, which is one little needle that I put, they actually put it in my bicep and they, the, that little needle, whatever it's doing can detect some kind of jitter that shows a neuromuscular issue. Um, both of my tests were negative, my EMG and my single fiber. When my single fiber was done though, he said it, it was inadequate and I have to get it done again. They actually didn't have time at the hospital to complete the full test, so I have to get another one done. Uh, but that's the next step after you suspect myasthenia gravis, but all the blood work is negative. Because sometimes all the stuff can be negative except for one thing. 
which eventually how we kind of had more of a confirmation was I got a uh, CT scan of my chest because there are often thymus issues associated with MG. Had not heard of a thymus before I got MG. <laughs> it's basically a gland that lives in your chest far closer to your heart than I thought. Um, almost connected, if I remember correctly. But anyway, so the thymus when you're younger is, when you're like a little kid young, is larger and helps to regulate your immune system. And then as you get older, it kind of shrinks and just turns into adipose tissue or fat tissue. So most of us have this fatty tissue in our chest about here-ish where the thymus once was. When you have myasthenia gravis, you, not everyone, this can be different, but some people either still have a fully intact large thymus that's out here messing up your immune system. Some people have tumors called thymomas on the thymus. Some people just have um, thymic hyperplasia, I believe it's called, which is like thymic residue. But all of these thymus things should not be there. <laughs> so when I finally got my CT scan, they found that I have thymic hyperplasia. So I have the residue of the thymus that's left behind. It did not turn into fatty tissue. It's still thymic tissue. And I also have a small mass on one side of my thymus. So I'm going to get that removed. I have a thymectomy coming up and a whole video about that as well. Uh, my surgeon says that he does not think it's a thymoma. He said it's thymic hyperplasia. It's not a thymoma. My neurologist thinks it might be an encapsulated thymoma. <laughs> so we'll see. The doctors are split. So after all that, the official diagnosis in all of my medical paperwork across all of my doctors and hospitals and surgeons and everything is seronegative myasthenia gravis. Uh, actually, more specifically, my, my surgeon told me because I don't have a thymoma, it is non-thymomic generalized seronegative myasthenia gravis, which basically just means I have MG, my blood test does not show it, and I don't have a thymoma. That's what my MG means. And since diagnosis, things have been better because once you know what the issue is, you can actually treat it versus just saying, oh, you have tennis elbow and fibromyalgia, which are clearly not the case. <laughs> so I have medication that I'm taking that I have a video talking about. Um, I'm getting my thymectomy surgery. I started IVIG infusions. So it's, it's getting better. I'm not 100% yet, but I'm going in a really good direction and I feel really good about feeling really good in the future. <laughs> I think I'm going to get better. I don't know if I'll get total 100% remission, but even if I could just get back to doing normal, more normal things, that would be great. And it's slowly, slowly happening. So that's it for this video. That's all my symptoms, how I got my diagnosis. I hope that was helpful. Uh, thank you for hanging out with me and my, my kitty cats who are video bombing. <laughs> Um, if there's anything else that you're familiar about with my MG journey, I have my IVIG video, my thymectomy video, my medication video, uh, and I think that's it. And always just feel free to, to reach out if you have any questions or comments or just want to chat as well. Because um, like I said, it's this is a rare disease and you can feel like you're alone in the world, but you're not. There's a bunch of us and we're all kind of experiencing the same things. So it's nice to just kind of have somebody to talk to with a similar experience. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.